Al-Aqsa Temple Mount dispute is continuing to rage. Yeah. So, um, as I said at the end of the year on Thursday, if you have any questions on that year, we can deal with them now. Deal with any questions. If you don't have questions, I'll continue with further aspects of this oh, same subject. Yeah. You, you said that um, we're in great danger from Iran. Yes. And um, does that mean we should leave? We should what? We should leave like they left uh, uh, Germany. Those that, those that left Europe survived the Holocaust. So if we're facing a Holocaust, should we also go and make survival uh, measures? In all matters of this nature, it's important for us to follow the uh, Sanhedrin of today, the Gedolei Hador. Yeah. At present, the Gedolei Hador are saying, stay. But perhaps the impossible individual who's really frightened and is in a bad state because of the situation, mm. and you can find, because it used to be called Nevesh, for some people. Yeah. The, the environment is So they might, uh, I think the general way of the Gadolim is to consider each question on its merits and also on the situation of the questioner. Yeah. So therefore, I'll give a parallel. We were in a more dangerous situation just before the Sixth Day War. And uh, on the whole, the Gadolim said, stay. But uh, if a little person came up and said, you know, my parents want to come back and I'm terrified here, they said, well, you better go. They're not going to make a general, there's no blanket ruling. But the schuss, I gave the example. I think I've quoted, I've quoted in one of the children, I quoted it to you. And the Shabbos, I managed to see the first thing. At the time, uh, shortly after the terrible massacres in Israel, where the threats were as great as now, actually, the, the, there was a massacre of the Holy Shiva in Hebron. It wasn't just here we had, here, here we witnessed five people, you know, who were killed in a cruel manner in the middle of Davening. And there, a yeshiva of the 50, 60 Bochrim, mm. most of them were killed in a similar cruel manner. When a short time before, the religious leaders of the Hebron community and the Muslim leaders had great bonds of friendship. Because uh, they worked it out in a peaceful manner, you know, every, everything. But uh, when uh, when the Mufti of Jerusalem, he made that massacre four years before Hitler came to power. So there was, I, I quote even from his direct discussion, there was a group of young yeshiva Bachan who very much wanted to go to Eretz to learn. And there was a good yeshiva here in Israel who would absorb the students. They wanted to go there, and they had they had ability. That one wasn't easy to get to get a, a passport to be able to come. But they got passports. They very much wanted to come. But most of the Rosh Hashim others is too dangerous. Some of the parents also. So he decided this uh, young scholar who, as far as I know, is the father of one of the greatest uh, Dayanim of today, Kofsky. So he decided to go to, it was, it was the year 1932. So he decided he's going to go to the Chobetz Chaim to ask him, oh. should he go on. Before it came to power, but uh, he was already, or doing after this, he was already doing his uh, anti-Semitic propaganda. And certainly the Mufti of Jerusalem, 
and it did the same in in in, in Palestine, as they call it, in Eretz Israel. So Cholos Chaim, there's there are the others. Or she also said you won't be able to learn there so well as you learn here. Cholos Chaim, first that that doesn't doesn't apply. If you really want to learn, the best place is Eretz Israel, because Chazal teach us who is Ahav Haaretz Ahitov. The gold of that country is very good, and there you find all the jewels. This is a reference, Torah Eretz Israel. Torah Eretz Israel is the highest level. Somebody wants to learn here, you reach the highest level. So said that's no reason. Then even before he could ask his other question, so the Prophet Chaim said, yes, who ye per Adam? He says concerned Ishmael. I know we're all concerned about the wildness of some of the Muslims, and he says he prophesied that even if you be a professor, and even if you be a lawyer, he'll still be wild. Don't think that you can tame them when the wildness comes out. But, he said, despite this, if you're going to learn Torah, Torah protects, you should go. The Chavetz Chaim always encouraged people to go. And uh, he was there, he was the greatest, in the last year of his life, he was the greatest um, scholar of his time. <coughs> and um, so therefore, in the situations we are now, because the Chobetz Chaim had such foresight, he also knew, had an idea of this, what, what was going to happen. And um, he would certainly, also today, if I to stay here. But still, it would, it would be according to the person. They're not going to have a blanket rule. Any other questions? This, this was in Radin? In Radin? Radin, yes. The Chorus Chaim himself wanted to come. And he even, uh, he even bought a house, uh, an apartment or something, to be able to come here. But the, the other rabbis, wouldn't let him. They said, we need you here. He said, well, he said, you this great rabbi is here. Now I, can, I want to go to Eretzitzvah to learn. But they said, we need you too much to create unity. So he felt that uh, they needed his, his enormous influence. And you want to know how great in, what great influence he had. Um, we saw now a picture of the Chovetz Chaim a big assembly. That big assembly was for leading rabbis and also leading communal workers who believed in the power of the Torah from all over the world. There were their doctors and professors and bankers and there were there were Abonim who belonged to Mizrahi and Baron who belonged to the Eid of Haredi. Yeah, all together. Uh, the Chobetz Chaim is only coming to that that Confnesia 92 years ago. If, um, if it's really going to be a demonstration of unity all over the world, and uh, there the Chobetz Chaim, interesting enough, all his daughters are filled with two messages: one is unity, and the other one is kill. To recognize the hope of the work hard. There's so many Jews. This is almost 100 years ago were assimilating and joining socialist groups and communist groups and, um, and uh, intermarrying in Western Europe, really becoming even baptized. We've got to work hard to bring all the Jews back. That was his big message. So, so, so um, uh, the Gedolim today would say the same. Rechaim, when Rechaim Kandievsky came out now, I'll put the leaflet in Hebrew, how uh, we have to strengthen our love for every Jew in every way. It says uh, it's one of the most important tasks of our time. And uh, help one another. And Hashem, I hope Hashem will protect us. And he even thinks that, you know, with this, uh, like the Chobos Chaim always used to say, I can see the Moshiach is come, he's waiting for us to do Shuva. And if even Chovetz Chaim came in dreams to all sorts of people who, who still had a glimpse of him before he died, and he came to them in dreams, 
he came to the sort of he came here at the time of dream even to the Mashkir of Lakewood hmm. and he came here to one of the heads of a Litvish Koilo who was as a youngster he he came to Hofschheim and uh, Rav Kanevsky is, is almost speaking in similar terms as the Lubavitcher Rebbe spoke. Yeah? It's, it's fortunate the Hasidim of Rav Kanevsky, uh, they're not going to even think of putting his picture in front of them when they're davening and declaring he's the Mashiach. But the way he talks is the same way the Rebbe Shebbe talks. So we're all going to choose them because the Mashiach is, 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 is around. And even everybody quotes the Tzor and Abu Chatzera, the one biggest Mekubalim, and respected from all sides. So he says he knows the Mashiach is here, he's around, and... Uh, what does that mean, he's around? Yeah, yeah. Because there's like this, there's a, there's a long-standing tradition based upon Altigo Vimshichai, do not touch and harm my Mashiachim, my those anointed with oil. Who are those? Elotin Okotcha Bet These are youngsters who are learning in Yeshiva, in Yeshiva, in Cheda, and they're all my Mashiachim. In other words, they're all potential Mashiachim. We don't know who's going to be the Mashiach. Oh. But um, the, in every generation, there's a potential Mashiach. So that's even the Rambam hints at it when he wants to explain Rabbi Akiva's situation. So he also explains there's a possibility of potential Mashiach, but he's got to be on a sufficiently high level, and the generations have got to be on a sufficiently high level, the Kurdish Boruch <coughs> will bring the redemption. Because the Rambam says, as a halacha, that and even the, is this Ira quote here, the Briskarov, you know, it's not, can't call him the, uh, follow Baal Shem Tov, the Briskarov, and a bit of a difference between the followers of Baal Shem Tov and the followers of the Vilna Gold's tradition, the Chaim Bologen, and the Briskar tradition. But the Briskarov himself explains us what's written in the Rambam. The Rambam says, and you can prove it from many things. You know, he proves it even from yesterday's Pasha, where it says, when Hashem said, Zakat the Dom Amora Kirava. When the cries that came to Dom and Amora, the cries were in the majority. It goes by majority of evil or majority of good. He said if there's majority for good, the world will be saved. Majority of evil, it will be destroyed. The same phrase is used before the Mabo, also Kirava. Because it's a din Ahrab and Hatis. Is a din b'shamay. We follow the majority. Now, the Kodesh Baruch also, he wants the world to be filled with a majority, a strong majority, because the world's not good enough. A strong majority, the force of love and virtue. And if it's going to be a strong majority, the opposite direction, there'll be destruction. And that was the whole debate between Avraham Avinu and Hashem: Can we have a strong enough majority or not? And the conclusion was. If you've got a million of people who are innocent, doesn't even tzaddikim there does not always mean righteous. It means a relative form. Then there's a time to give it another chance. But what happens to the majority for evil is so strong? There's not even a million which is considered the smallest unit to create a society, to create a social group. Then uh, all Saddam Namora became destroyed which is a warning for the type of destruction that might come on the whole world. Because it happened before with the Mabul Shel and Mayim. And it might happen Mabul Shel Eish. And that's, that's, that's what it is today. But no, what's going to be the majority force? The force of evil and hate, or the force of virtue and love? That's the question. Now, this, this situation which we are today, and in fact, if you read any books on the future of mankind, they all say that the world today is a powder keg, a powder keg of dynamite, which can blow up all life on this planet thousands of times, and don't need somebody to spark it, and don't know what's going to happen. But some say, you know, this, this, this concept 
of the balance of terror stops each side using. And all right, that what's called the uh, what's called um, the mutually assured destruction, mad madness, yeah, mutually assured destruction. Since it's mutual, therefore no side is going to do anything, and this balance of terror has been holding, in fact. But the great fear today increases all the time. If somebody's a bit of a maniac, gets hold of it, what's going to happen? And uh, of course, there's a huge blow with 9 11. We I mean, saw that uh, we've got maniacs who don't care about killing themselves and killing others. So we have to pray to Hashem that we won't allow it to happen. He'll, he'll interfere like he has interfered in the Six Day War. So, to, now to, I'm going to bring this now to a further level as follows. And first, it's all got to do with the third day, we know, the, the present level, which is very difficult to obliterate, is the Alaksa, the heart abide dispute. And this afternoon was the, was, was the talk last week. I'll, just, I'll explain to you that Rabbi Yossi's entrance to Chov of Yisraelayim has a lot to do with the Temple Mount of the, and Yisraelayim. So, uh, first I'm going to introduce it to, to get a, a wider picture also of the Agadot, of the sages and what they mean. So there's a discussion. We know the Temple of Mount is called Ha Ha Moria. What does Moria mean? So Gomorrah says in Tanit, page 16, Pliga Bora Blebe Bachum Rabbi Machlekes. Rabbi Chandina says, Chadama. Ha Che Yatza Mimen Horal Yisrael. It's a mountain from which Torah instruction goes out to Israel. So, there's a number of descriptions of this. Some say, it's like we say, Ki mitzion te itse Torah. Torah goes out from Zion. And um, the great Sanhedrin, which was the supreme body for deciding the question of Torah law, convened in Lishkat HaKazit, the chamber of hewn stone on the Temple Mount in Yushalayim. In addition, the prophet stood there when rebuking the Jewish people for their shortcomings. So this comes from the root Moria from Yarat to teach. Same root for his Torah. <coughs> so let's first analyze this from, from a number of angles. But some say that the we spoke about this already. The Torah was originally given on which mountain? Chore. There was a Chore in Sinai. But then, after that supernatural event, which produced the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, which in retrospect has influenced the world more than any other. Uh, moral text which exists and continues to influence. So what happened to the holiness of Mount Sinai? Uh, so I want to bring a, an interesting episode which happened in the history of the yeshiva hmm. when we were in Hebron. Hmm. Uh, a lady came from America, a rich lady, and her plan was to spread the Ten Commandments, which were very important for all human beings, such times of conflict. We have to put up a sign everywhere for the Ten Commandments. She did already in the States. When she came here, she arranged for the Ten Commandments to be put up on nearly every more uh, populated um, junction near the traffic lights 
she produced a poster, and you would find it all over Israel, Ten Commandments. Hmm. So when we approached her, maybe she will help us in the yeshiva. At that time, we will have on yeshiva. So we also agreed, we put up the Ten Commandments at the entrance of the yeshiva, and she gave us a nice contribution. <laughs> then we asked her a bit more, she said, well, I would like someone to put up the Ten Commandments where they were given. So is there anybody ready? At that time you could still go to see now. It's a bit uh, risky, but not, 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 nothing like today. It was basically no man's land. It was a bit more, pe more peaceful with Egypt. And in fact, uh, Sadat, I think, even agreed that there should be a uh, meeting of the three faiths. There, would be a, there is already there on what is considered to be the place which was Har Sinai. There is a mosque, there is a monastery there. And uh, so she said, we have to, and he also, we have to build not just the monastery, we also have to have a, a mosque there, and even have a synagogue there, in order to represent all those faiths that gain their strength from the Ten Commandments. So she said, I want somebody to go and put a plaque up there. Now, I don't know, some of you have met him, some of you have not. I've got a son, already when he was a youngster, he loved exploring, and uh, he loved traveling also. So he, he was a he was in Shiva, my son Avraham, became afterwards he was army chaplain. So he, he, he said he'll go. So we prepared a big plaque at the Ten Commandments, he went and put them on the top of the mountain of Sinai. Yeah. I don't know if they're still there. <laughs> <laughs> no. In any case, what happened, this, it's, it's really written in the Tanakh, if you look carefully in different places. I just, it says, Hashem, Bom, Sinai, Bakodesh. There's a verse, a phrase in Zilin, Hashem is in the midst of the people. How? Because Sinai was transferred to the Mikdash. The first Mikdash was the sanctuary. So the Sinai episode, which took just one day, the, 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 in fact, the Ramban goes into this in more detail. He says the, the glowing ark and its lid with the cherubs was glowing a little bit like a fire, and from there Hashem continued to explain the Aserat Adibrat and the rest of the Torah to Moshe Rabbeinu. So therefore, to make it more continuous, the Torah of the Aserat Adibrat was transferred to the sanctuary. And from the sanctuary it went into the temple. For the sanctuary was temporary in different places, so it came to rest in Jerusalem, where? On Ha'amuriah. So therefore, the episode of Matan Torah and the Aserat that they brought that are hints for the whole Torah, and we know the 620 letters, and of Sadiq on, he put all the 630 mitzvot under the category of the Ten Commandments. So this was all transferred to, to the mit, to Ha'amuriah. So Misham Tetzia Torah, so the Torah comes, keep it see on Tetzia Torah, for all ages. And we say also, the holiness of the Temple Mount remains forever. Because the holy place will inscribe it. So, uh, we can therefore understand why is it that the Sanhedrin, who have the duty to apply the laws of the Torah in practice to each generation, as long as the head was stood, their main hall was also on the Temple Mount. In the time that made himself to hall and everything, and shown sure was part of the Temple Mount, there was not the Beit HaMikdash, it was next to the Beit HaMikdash, in the time when the Beit HaMikdash stood. And then they knew exactly where the Beit HaMikdash was actually standing. First, in the first Beit HaMikdash, and next to the Lishkata Kazit. And so what does it really teach us? The Temple Mount 
is the place from which decisions go out to all Amisar. What happens when unfortunately there's a mosque on the temple and we are not in a situation of purity that we're allowed to go there. Not any of the Kohanim, not the greatest of Kedolim, they're not allowed to go there because we don't know exactly the measurements and so on. So we have to wait for the Mashiach. It was even a more limited situation in the second temple period. Now we've got no temple at all. And we've got no purity. So therefore, who is in place of the Sanhedrin? We would know that. That's it. Nishkata Gazit. We should know in place of the Sanhedrin are the greatest Gudalim in Torah of the time. So we follow them. So today we follow the consensus of the biggest Gudalim, or there's certain areas where have difference of opinion. So we won't go into all the details of it now, but in general, this is the Kedusha of today that we've got. Like is hinted at in Yagada, that the Shekhinah is there today in the Pati Knesset and Pati Midrash, and certainly the leaders of the Pati Knesset and Pati Midrash, they're the ones who can give us guidance today. So that's one explanation of Hamuria. But then it says another explanation, that the word Moria is connected to the word Mora, from which fear went out to the idolatrous nations. So when the idolaters heard of the grandeur of the Jewish nation, the Holy Mountain, where the Shekhinahs were, they were overcome with fear of the Jewish people. That's one explanation. Moriah is from Yare to fear. Hmm. Or it's a reference, it says here, to Hora'ah. Fear came upon them with some from Sinai and the Shekhinah. What somebody else says, it's when the Torah was given to the Jews, so it says, Eretz Ra Yereva Shakata. There were others who were afraid. They see the greatness of the call of Israel. And therefore, they had some fear. And we can say, you can also say, Mora Lo of the Kochavim, because sometimes we can give a better interpretation to any predictions about the future if it's already taken place, and what it is taking place. Today, I think we can say, today, fear goes out to the world on account of the Ofte Kochavim who have taken over the Temple Mount. And they're doing it in such a manner that they're distorting the, 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 the minds of children and youngsters to follow hate and to follow what is really idolatry, even though they call it God, if they worship death and they worship the distortions of the Quran in a, in a manner that is really twisting the, let's say, the more virtuous concepts of the Quran that says you have to show respect to the teaching of Moses and which also says that the place of holiness for the people of Israel is really Mecca and that this, this land is left for the people of Israel. So it's, it's, it's today, moral of the Chavim means the terror that comes from the idolaters have taken it over. Because today Islam is really a form of idolatry, even though they call Allah was allowed to worship in a mosque because of the, let's call it, because of the more compromising and more moral leaders of Islam, like for example, as I said, Sheikh Palazzi, but there are others as well, there are many Imams who are very much against what's going on today. But they, or they, they, they still, they, many of them claim the, the people of Israel have to take the initiative to go back to God and his religion, and then we can work something out. But definitely on the whole, there's more than, there's great fear all over the world when we have such groups as theirs who, who twist everything. 
We recognize today you've got to twist people's minds. And therefore, they use all forms of propaganda and demonstration of the things which will bring fear into people's minds concerning murder, concerning cruelties, with the, with the obscenities that are performed with maximum publicity to create possibility to make people feel that we have to live a life of fear and that uh, the only path is the most extreme path chosen by these criminals who do criminal deeds. And the more you do the criminal deeds and repeat them, they're trying to outdo Goebbels used to say, also used the propaganda machine. You have to keep on telling the lie and tell it as often as possible, and tell it to as many populations as possible, and the more you tell it, the more it will become believed. And uh, when you find now the present Mufti of Jerusalem, his claim is that Mount Moriah was given to the Muslims at creation. <laughs> and before, before Muslim existed, that's his, that's his chapter. It belongs only to the Muslims. And the others, I mean, even the Muslims today, he speaks violently. The Muslim of Jerusalem. Today, we must make sure that no Jew goes on the mountain whatsoever. Uh, in a way, Jews aren't, we're not allowed to go in any case. But we're not allowed to go because it's so holy. And he doesn't allow us to go because he thinks we should disappear from the whole land. And he's, he's, a, he's a proper partner with our strongest enemies. So this is, uh, this is the situation today of the two positive interpretations of Ha Muria. So, however, there's, there's, there's an even deeper teaching, which is to, also to bring you a very interesting episode of Rabba Baba Khona. But before that, have you got any questions? Or comments? There were 613 letters in the Ten Commandments? Ten Commandments, 620. 620. Yes. 620. They say, they say <coughs> that uh, when the non-Jew came to Hillel and he asked him, uh, can you give me the whole Torah on one leg? So, <coughs> so um, Hillel said to him, you know, consider your neighbor is your neighbor, and therefore, whatever is hateful unto you, do not do to your neighbor. So where is that a foot? That's one foot of the Torah. But some say the 613 letters, and the seven last letters, Asher Lerecha. These are the last letters of the Decalogue, Asher Lerecha. Think always, in everything you do, connect it with your neighbor. Asher l'recha, b'chol asher l'recha. Same letters. So asher l'recha is the foot of the Aserat that they brought. You see, the Aserat contains 630 letters. Since it's the 613 mitzvot, then you've got that as the foot. It's very interesting. For the, where does the 630 come from? There's some, Ramban says it's not significant, it's Agadah. But the Rambam, and the Bahag and others, they say no, it's a very deep oral tradition. If you look where from which, from which parasha do we learn the mitzvah of writing the Sefer Torah? 
the last mitzvah of the Torah to write a Sefer Torah. From which Pasha do we learn it? Moshe um, Mordechai. You're learning Sofra. From which Pasha? From where do we learn to, the mitzvah to write a Sefer Torah? Mitzvah of the Torah. What is it? What? Well, where is that written? Which is what Sashi does? No, I think in Berlin. I think in Berlin. I'm not sure. You're not sure? I'm not sure. It's, it's, it's one of the last parts. You're sure? It's one of the last parts. Yeah, which is it? I think it's the last part. It's called the song. Which song is it? Hazinu. Hazinu. What's the song? No, guy, you know which is the song. Hazinu. It's Ashira Azat. What is this? What's the song called? Azino. Huh? Azino. The song the Pasha of Azino. Yeah? The really last song of Moses. Yeah? It's a sad song. The last song of Moses. To talk about endings. How many words does it have? That song? What do you think? 613? Yes, 613. 613. 613 words. Nice. 613. So therefore we say it's a hint that this Shira hints at all the 613 mitzvot, <coughs> which is really the core of the whole Torah. Yeah. So it's significance. That's a shell of Echa. So he said, if you love your fellow man like yourself in a true manner, that's really the foot of the whole Torah, that's the real thing. And, but others say, some say, Asher Lereecha is to give the stamp on the 613 mitzvot, which applies to all the nations of the world. The no Chai Code is basically putting into practice a more perfect society for which you also need to accept that the authority comes from Hashem, but the contents of it are included in the Aser of the Dibra, Hashem Recha. You're speaking to a non-Jew, it says to him, you want to know, you want to come and become a Gatzedek? Go and fulfill the Noachite code. So when I was on the best day, mm -hmm. even as students, I want to become Jews. So I said, what we before I was a Christian, but I want to become Jewish. So I said to them, you don't need to become Jewish to be a saint. You can become a non-Jew, who is a Ben Noach, who keeps the Noachite code properly. And if you do that, you reach a very high level, the same level as the Jew. I don't want to make a good Christian to a bad Jew. And that's what that skaters today in the whole world is frequently a good Christian is made a bad Jew. Because they say, all the mitzvahs you have to fulfill, you don't fulfill them. Mm. Yeah. That's why you need geirots. Yeah, It's very proper geirots. And, and, the, and the false geirots and insults to the true geirots said on a high, very high level. So, but I want to bring this now with the following Agadic passage from Rabbi Baba Chonah. So Rabbi Baba Chona was a type of Robinson Crusoe, one would say. Hmm. Or what they call it, what's, what's the German one called? Swiss Family Robinson? Huh? It's a German one oh. who, who saw all fun, almost unusual uh, events and adventures. Euro, you, you know the European? The European Robinson Crusoe. Anyway, Rabbi Chona was a very great scholar. And uh, he relates so many fantastic um, events that took place when he went around exploring. They will have a deeper meaning. So I'll bring you now here. This is the... Um, it's the, uh, the fifth story, fifth episode. Rabbi Ochona said, once we were going in the desert, Oh, that's the geese. No, not that one. Just a minute. Not the geese. And, uh, and let's see.
said that if he has, I myself saw a certain frog and the size of the city of Agronia. And how big is the city Akra of Agronia? Sixty houses. Then a sea monster came and swallowed the frog. The female raven came and swallowed the sea monster. And it flew up and sat on the branch of a tree. Come and see how strong that tree was. Now Papa Shmuel said, had I not been there myself, I would never have believed it. <laughs> you know, or when I was a boy, I used to see Ripley, believe it or not. A similar <laughs> author. <laughs> you saw that? No, it was, you know. No, in, in school that the Ripley, believe it or not, there also all sorts of stories, <laughs> it was unusual things that you can have. If you wouldn't have seen it, they can't believe it. <laughs> so, what does this mean? First, I'll bring you here and the explanation of the Vilna Gaon. Talmidic Chachamim are compared to frogs. Just as frogs are never silent, neither day nor night, so two, two Talmidic Chachamim are tirelessly occupied with the study of the Torah, non-stop. You know, uh, anyone you read the biography, the great Zuchot to sit next to him also in the shiur and Rabbi Yashem Tzatzal. Even whenever Matt was in, he created a lot of chesed for, for all sorts of people who were willing to be sounded. But every minute, learning, learning, and teaching, the baby teaching. A great time in Cholom is mastered six tractates of the Talmud. <sighs> Verily, a frog has 60 houses. Talmud Chom is called his master of Shas, 60 houses. There exists a sea monster, a terrible force that antagonizes those who are immersed in the sea of knowledge. The Yitzhara distracts Talmud Chom from their studies and persuades them, go and seek materialistic possessions. How can you overcome that monster, the Yitzhara? All other mother birds feed their young, but the female raven abandons them, leaving Hashem himself to feed them. If the Talmud really wants to succeed, he will leave the support of his family in the hands of God. God will surely prepare a tree for him to sit on. The tree represents the Torah supporter. As it's written, tree of life, it's Chaimir Machzikimbo, to the supporter. So the Torah confers the quality tree of life on those that support it. Mm. Come and see how strong that tree was. The person who parts with his money for the sake of Torah demonstrates an unbelievable strength in conquering the natural desire to amass wealth. I'm telling you, this is this is taking place today. There's so many people that think, well, how can I go and learn? Mm -hmm. uh, they get married, and uh, for, for a year his wife can work. Then after she, one child after the other, she can't go to work. Yes. Who's going to help him? Yeah, what's going to happen? I'll tell you, what I saw this year is unbelievable. Yeah, unbelievable. I mean, Hashem is giving Torah supporters such wealth <laughs> on a high level, and they use it to support more Torah. So I must tell you, it's an experience. Perhaps you wondered when we made the supper dinner, <laughs> Then after the Sukkot dinner, there was dancing, simple space of Sheva, in the Yeshiva, those who married took part. But, um, but someone told me that Shlomo Rechnitz, who's a singer and a composer, at the same time, he's a huge Torah supporter, and it's given millions and millions to the Miri Yeshiva he used to learn. That's a Hasidish guy, the tall guy? No. Oh. The Miri Yeshiva is the biggest Yeshiva in the world. Uh, I mean, see, it's got, I don't know, how many Bochum, maybe, maybe 2,000, but I think it's got five or 6,000 married students. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, they can manage for a time, then they go to work. Well, he having been also in that yeshiva, 
and Hashem blessed him and his brother with enormous wealth. Mm. And he keeps on using it to support Torah. Mm. So someone told me he's there, and maybe, you know, we can get a, a little bit. <laughs> I know he's going to receive his mail, but, but maybe he has something as well. At least I want to meet with him. I've met with him already. Met him twice already. <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't think he gave it. He gave what you know, what peanuts, you know, in comparison. Because Miri Yeshiva, when the when the former of Shiva died, he was very good sadly. And they were in debt, I think, uh, 30 million or something. Wow. So I think he straight away gave him 10 million dollars or something. He helped them out enormously. And uh, when I came, so I, what's the, what's the, he said he's there. He you meet him, Miri Yeshiva. So, so, so Dr. Bank, you know, who's, who's, who pushed, he helps us so, so much, <laughs> he said, must go and see, maybe we can speak with him. And also, Fry Mendelssohn was here with his fantastic singing, and he said he knows him. Fry Mendelssohn is also a composer and a singer. And, and years ago, he used to be in his house and even, I think, produced a disc, so maybe he can get the better introduction. Went there, uh -huh. So he was in the middle of a talk. I thought they'd be dancing, but the Holy Shiva was crowded that people could hardly sit or stand there. No possibility to dance at all. And they were all looking at a video. No, he was speaking. He was speaking to the screen and described it something how Hashem blesses him. The more he gives, the more, he, more, more money Hashem gives him. And there on the spot, he also announced, I think he's giving another $10 million to pay for the Avrichim. And well, then, of course, that, that was a... And but he, was, he, was, he was either singing, I couldn't get hold of him, but I tell you that Hashem gives. This, this is what's written here. People who say, well, I've got good potential to learn, I love learning, but I've got to look after my family. What, what's his name again, I'm sorry? So, so Shlomo Lechnitz is a good example of someone, but there are many others like that. I mean, it's been happened quite a few times, even people with whom I sat down in yeshiva learning, some of them, they, 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 of course, in the previous generation, they also paid millions for the yeshiva, the Reichman family. They also paid many millions to keep Torah thriving. And that's happening today. So this is, this is his interpretation. But before the Vilna go on, the Marshal. Marshal is a regular commentary on all the Gemorras. Halach, on the Ola Halachot, Rashi, and Toysus. But he also gives very authoritative commentaries on the Agadot. And the Agadah that he gives, the Akadic explanation he gives mm. in his time, which was now about 400 years ago, before, much before the Vilna Gaon, is so applicable to our time that uh, it's worthy of our interpretation to based on him. So he says like this, of course, he's, he says, you can explain Daniel who had visions of what's going to happen in the future. So he sees that all the empires, he compares them in his visions, they are compared to wild animals that are destructive. So Rabbi Baba Chona and quite a few of his episodes have a different interpretation today because you can see it happening. So it's like this. This is a reference. What did he see? He saw the persecution of the Jewish people by our enemies that will take place from the time of the Second Temple till the time of the Redemption. So he saw the frog and he says there are certain... It's a three-minute warning. There's a certain... There are certain references in number of Gomorrahs that Greek wisdom is compared to the frog. Why to the frog? Because... Well, the Unicorn says, Talmud HaChachamim. But the, one of the 
we can say, more positive aspects of Greek civilization where they're very much concerned with producing dialogues, scientific investigation, and they left many books, and they're even more, apart from their own books, there are different discussions that took place, especially Athens was a place where on a high level of, there weren't, there weren't in, in Athens, but Sparta was different, part of the, the military training, but the, the highest flower of Greek civilization was in Athens. And Athens was a place of scholarship, investigation, trying to understand the world. So they're like frogs all the time, all the time quacking, quacking, talking. Came to discussion. So the greatest works are dialogues, because Socrates and Plato, the dialogues are the greatest uh, sources. We believe very much in this. When, when it says, how many cities? So it says, Shishim Hemelachot. He says, there's a reference concerning verses in the, in, in the Tanakh that the conquests that took place under Alexander the Great, they covered 60 major cities in the world. I mean, it took over part of, part of Asia, part of Europe, the Macedonian development of the Greek Empire from, from small Athens and Greece it became the largest empire of its time in the world. These were 60 cities taken over Alexander Mokotov. What, what happened, however, to the Greeks? The Greeks were swallowed up by the Romans. So the frog swallowed up, the frog was swallowed up, the frog, the Greek civilization was swallowed up by the Romans. And the Romans are called the, the serpents. They're nochos. Well, the Romans, uh, they were Greek. They, it's true, they, they put into their philosophy to some extent Greek civilization, but it was, became transformed into, into an orderly empire on the highest level of ruling the world that was known then, and building up that physical world, as far as the Jewish people is concerned, they were like a serpent. Alexander the Great was good to us, but the, the Romans took over, they really destroyed us, and they did so much harm to us, destroyed the Beit HaMikdash, and they destroyed the realms of the Jewish people. And then came along, the female raven. It's called an orev. Who is the female raven? So the female orev is Arab, same root. Yeah, because of darkness. Whatever it is. Arab. The Arabs are darker. Marab, the West is dark. Marab is when it gets dark. Arab. And the female one is Malchut Ishmael. Why? Because the Tumma of Ishmael doesn't come from this male side. His father was a tzaddik, Avraham Avinu. But his mother, his mother went back to a Tumma. She even gave him a wife from Egypt. She, she left everything. And unfortunately, she says even, it says, it says in Gomorrah, the swallow, why the swallow go to join him with Oreb? It's also a reference to Ishmael. Why did Ishmael went to Eretz Israel and conquered it? So what did Ishmael do? Ishmael conquered Eretz Israel. That the, the Muslims took over Judea, in which in which the hood and he, so what did they, what what is the female, the female raven? What does it do? It puts itself on the strong tree. Who's the strong tree? The tree is Avraham Avinu. It's the strong tree which gives the Muslims such power. Well, they said, why the Muslims have power of it? It's Israel. It says that if the Jewish people are empty of mitzvot in Eretz Israel, then comes the tefillah of Avraham Avinu mm. and the schut of his pitmila. Mm -hmm. And the fact that he does mention 
many of them in a good manner, that they believe in one God, spiritual. And we keep him praying the most. And they took over Eretz Israel, which is a promise. He's given a promise. That was Atif, the Goy Gadol. The Avraham is called the Tree of Life. Hmm. The even many by Taisha the Vashava, that means Avraham himself was the Aisha, was the oak tree. And the Eshpo Eitz means also. So you see, what is the great Sukhut of the tree of Avraham Avinu? And he said, even until today, they have their power over Eretz Israel in his time, time, Mashal certainly, until the redemption will come. So, we see here this Agadah, the Sami said, explains to us the present situation. It's a, and Rabbi Babachana, it's interesting, one of the other episodes, he said they were going in a boat. Time. Okay. Do you want to continue with this tomorrow? Because yes. Uh, and any questions also?